All right, Mr. Brett Bortz, thank you so much for being on the Elite Agent Talk. Excited to have you. Uh, it was great meeting you at um, the Mega Conference. How you How you doing? Pretty good, man. Pretty good. I um, it's it's been a while actually. I forgot how long ago that was. I mean, it was only a few months, but it sounds like feels like it was a while ago. So much has changed already. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, you're kicking ass over there in uh, North Houston, uh, Farmers Agent. And uh, yeah, you got a lot to share. So I'm really excited about this one. But uh, yeah, tell me your story. Um, well, right now, I just want to share with the audience that you're writing 500 to 600,000 in premium every month. So um, yeah, it's incredible how, because how long have you been a farmer's agent right now? Um, an actual agency owner, we opened up May 1st of 2023. So oh, wow. Past our first year. That's amazing. So yeah, tell me your story. How'd you get started in insurance? I'm pretty sure you have some maybe insurance experience before starting your own agency. So take it back as far as you can and uh, let us know how you got started. For sure, for sure. Well, first, I want to say thank you for having me. Uh, this is a huge honor, Dan. I've been a huge fan of yours. So this is, uh, it's hard not to be a fangirl, right? When you have someone that you look up to and you watch and you hear from all the time. I mean, Dan, if anyone is new, Dan back in the day, man, he was the king. He was the king. He was the man, the number one. Um, everyone wanted to be like him, you know? And uh, to me, this is kind of like if someone met one of the role models. Uh, so but, uh, everyone kind of give me a little grace here. But if I get a little screamish. <laughs> oh, thanks, man. Uh, yeah. For sure. It was a pleasure meeting you at the mega conference, man. This guy just, oh, he gave so much knowledge, knowledge about, we had about 50 agents there and he just started spewing knowledge. And, uh, and that's why I kind of call him Dan the man, because this guy has been through so much. He's seen through, through so much. Uh, and it's just an honor to be able to kind of have someone like this kind of help give me a little insight to one things. Um, and so I'm just excited to be here. Uh, I started an in insurance back when I was 18. I'm 27 right now. So I'm a, I'm a young guy. I just turned 27 day after Christmas. Um, and so I started insurance about 18. So over eight years ago, I came out of high school. I graduated high school. I barely passed that. I, I you know, skirted through. I graduated high school. I was telling this in the, the last uh, webinar I was on. I graduated high school, the 1.7 GPA, I think 1.8. I don't know. Um, so around there, but it was really bad, really low. There was over 730, 740 kids in my class. I was towards the bottom, 690. Ne always been told, you know, I've never amounted to anything if I keep doing what I was doing. And they were right. If I would have kept doing what I was doing, which was sleeping, not doing anything, being lazy, I probably wouldn't have amounted to anything. But when I got into, had the opportunity for insurance, it was either college or insurance in my summer of 2015. And I was like, wow, I really hate school. I like learning what I like to learn about, but I do not like schooling. Um, <clears throat> so I had the opportunity for my cousin and my sister, which have been in my mentors in my life, uh, not just for business, but personal. Uh, huge blessing to have them in my family. Um, they took me and said, hey, Brett, come work as a telemarketer agency and kind of see where you go from there. So I did. I did it for a few months. Finally got my license. It was either get my license or go to college. Um, and this is back at Allstate. And I remember I was at my house. Uh, I am a Christian. So I was sitting there. I was like praying. I was like, you know, do I do I do college or do I do, you know, insurance? And as I did that, I, I kind of opened my eyes and I saw there was an Allstate bag right in front of me. I was like, I guess that's what it is. I guess I'm going Allstate instead of college. So I said, Mom, Dad, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm not going to college. Um, the, you know, the youngest of four siblings. Um, so that was kind of a surprise to them. They said, wow, okay, well, you better try hard, you know, and they, they kind of pushed me on that. My dad is really, really, um, uh, positive and, and been a great figure of that. And same, same with my mom. Um, and so anyways, I, I dove into, um, insurance instead of college and I loved it. I got my license. So I started killing it. Um, actually I take the back. I was not killing it. I was lazy when I actually first started. I was doing horrible. It was a horrible 18 year old kid, as you can imagine, right? Selling insurance. Um, and I learned a lot from that. And finally, I became a telemarketer manager for our telemarketing team we had. And then I became a sales manager for the uh, four offices we had that my cousin and my sister had at Allstate. They had four different agencies. Um, so they were doing really well, loving it. Um, left there, went to independent, left there because I hated independent. The grass is not greener on the other side. I apologize. I went from Allstate to farmers, left farmers to independent. And then I was like, oh, I hate this. And I came back to Farmers, was a producer, saved up for a while. And then now we have this agency. Um, and uh, my sister, cousin, and my brother um, own a management company, the Encindo. Uh, and they kind of help and work with me um, on my agency. I help, I use, utilize their services. <clears throat> oh, wow. So yeah. it's like a family business, huh? 
Kind of, yeah. So they're they're you know they're they're family. So they give me more help than uh, than, uh, than just business. They help me out, um, and uh, I do you know help with the sales training, and they do different things too. Um, and uh, I utilize them a lot. They help me. My cousin does all the recruiting a lot. He helps me with sales training. He's the first one that originally taught me sales first uh, as well. Um, so I'm really appreciative of him. He stopped me so much life advice. And as you can imagine, I was an 18 year old kid in insurance. I didn't even know my months in order, Dan. I knew the months and I knew how to spell them, but I didn't know how to put them in order. And I remember one day I told him that when I was trying to fill out an envelope, which I also didn't know how to do, right? And he was like, my cousin was like, oh my gosh. So he made me stay to like 11 p.m., maybe midnight. He was like, you're not leaving until you can tell me your months in order. You could not work in a professional environment without knowing your months, uh, with Without knowing how to do an envelope. Uh, and so, yes, to anyone out there hiring young people, that is a possible thing, right? Um, and uh, I had to learn that, you know, and I, I had to mature and, and learn life wisdom over the last eight years. And I, I feel like it's been a, a journey and I'm loving it, I'm loving every bit of it. <laughs> yeah, well, you came a long ways. Yeah, I'm hoping. Um, still plenty of ways to go. I mean, there's there's amazing agents out there I'm, I'm meeting and talking with like you. I mean, oh my gosh, what was, I think, uh, I don't want to correct you. How much were y'all writing? I know y'all and y'all are killing it when California was top of the top of the chain. Oh uh, yeah, we were doing about um we were doing over seven hundred per month. Yeah, holy yeah. cow, man. Imagine. Holy yeah. cow. That's why people yeah. know. <laughs> but we'll get back up there. Um, yeah. you know, it, it, every year is different. But yeah, talk to us a little bit about, you know, how important it is to, and how grateful you are probably to have your sister and your cousin. Like, you know, and if what if agents don't have that type of relationship with anybody? What's the what's the plan? What helped you learn, you know, and starting from the bottom, what was that like? Yeah, start from the bottom. Um, so definitely. And that's what I want people to understand is, uh, you know, how how is someone like me at where I'm at? Um, well, <laughs> I don't do nothing. That's for sure. But I definitely have a lot of help from my family. Um, my sister does a whole different side. Her, she, she had an agency. I think she was like number 42 in the country for a while, uh, for new production. Um, so she sold her agency and she, she opened up a management uh, company in Sindo, uh, with a brother and cousin. And, uh, and I was like, Hey, I want to open an agency. Let's, you know, let's start this off. Maybe one day we'll help other agents, but that's not in our vision right now. Um, but let's start off. Let's figure things out. We each have key things we're good at. You know, I usually do the sales training. I usually do the, some of the tech side, some of the, um, processes and stuff. Um, and then my sister has the compliance down really hard. She does the servicing. She does a lot of higher level stuff, taking care of anything that's really major or kind of a fire within the agency. So to say, she's amazing and handling that credible. Um, and, uh, she's doing a meeting right now with the other, uh, peeps, um, and then of course my brother has technology background and stuff, and he really helps on that side so we can help learn processes, uh, develop technologies that help, uh, you know, push things through. I know a lot of people are using agency zoom automation now. Um, so there's a lot of things that we're keying together. We use certain little programs within our uh, company that help mod modify, modify stuff. For example, my brother, uh, got us a technology called crisp AI, which allows us to have an open environment and cancel out all background noise. We love it. It's been huge success and help for us. So any agent that comes up next to another agent that's talking on the microphone, if another agent's talking right next to them, the AI will actually cancel out that noise completely. Um, so it's actually super cool. Um, so there's been a lot of little things. I think something that's really led to our success there, Dan, and I try to tell us a lot of people, cause they're always like, what's your secret? What's your secret? What's the sauce? You know, I'm like, it's not necessarily one sauce. There's like, there's like a thousand different ingredients to that sauce. We do a thousand different little things really, really well that help towards our success. And our team is phenomenal. We just have an amazing team. I mean, how lucky are we to have a team that actually wants to work every day, wants to come in, even likes working on the weekends sometimes. Um, they just really love grinding and hitting their sales numbers. Uh, but we each kind of have a piece of the pie that fits together really well as a puzzle. Uh, and that's what makes our uh, our success right there. Um, and hopefully, and as we can learn through this meeting, that there is ways to do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's so many little things. What are some of those bigger, smaller things when it comes to like systems and processes for you, like um, that has cha maybe changed the game for you? Yeah, for sure. So I, uh, I deal with a lot of the leads. Um, originally it was my cousin, but now I do a lot of the leads. <clears throat> and the way, uh, the way one secret that we use is we use uh, like every lead provider you can imagine, uh, under the sun, except ever quote, um, uh, not a huge fan of theirs, but, uh, 
you know, for reasons. Uh, but the um, uh, we use a lot of different companies on there, and we need to kind of be like you. I think you do your own lead development. Is that correct? Yeah. I want to learn there. And um, one thing I've noticed is I think a lot of, uh, and we learn this through experiences, usually as an agent, you kind of want to know everything and you want to feel like the person, the smart person in the agency. We don't have a problem at all letting our pride go and saying, hey, um, we brought in this one individual. They're way smarter than us. Uh, teach us what you know. I brought in this 20 year old guy um, and uh, he's incredibly intelligent. Uh, and he uh, he does uh, lead generation. He does his own lead generation at times too. Uh, I was like, hey, uh, let's bring you in and help figure this out because I would love to see where this goes. I know there's some there's talks right now. If you know, I learned this from Mariah Gates uh, that there is some talks right now for uh, how leads may be changed, where they might have to be exclusive, more so exclusive, uh, coming up in this year if that law passes. Um, of course, I'm not too smart for all that stuff, but. Uh, mm -hmm. Um, I knew I want to be prepared. I know as a business owner, we need to be prepared for possible stuff. We don't ever want to have one source of income, one source of leads. So we do have a lot of things going. We have a marketer to do uh, natural and organic lead gathering um, where the team can kind of pass off their lead sources to that marketer. So if that uh, one thing that's important, by the way, to, uh, for everyone on there is, is you may have seen this. If you have a uh, one of your sales producers that has five networking partners, if that sales producer leaves, you can't uh, obtain those uh, lead, you know, those networking partners, right? So mm -hmm. with our marketer, if they're the one networking and they stay with us and it happens to be my sister in this case, one of my other sister, I have two sisters. Um, and, uh, she does all the networking. Well, then when the sales producer leaves, that's fine. We still have that, that uh, network there. Right. Uh, and if she ever leaves too, I'll make sure we're acquainted with those individuals so we can uh, get that warm transfer over to whoever would be taking that new position open. Um, so that, uh, <clears throat> that has really helped us on, uh, keeping leads in different spaces as well. We do live transfers, we do internet leads. Um, automation is very key. You know, that's very helpful to help your work day to be more efficient. Uh, so we do love doing all that. Um, what else? We don't do mailers. Um, I know there's some amazing people out there to do mailers and we can learn a thing or two about that, but we don't do mailers. Um, I think my next venture is I want to figure out how to generate my own leads like Dan over here uh, and just kill it. And I feel like that's, uh, I do have a question for it. Has that helped you save money for your expenses, developing your own lead system? Would you say that actually saved money? Um, you know, Saving money, probably not because as you scale, you know, you just spend more. But I would say it has probably helped my producers' job duties or their job description because, you know, what better than a call that's coming in, you know, rather than calling yeah. out, getting a lot of rejections. So I feel like maybe they have a more sustainable job now, a more pleasurable job, a little less rejection because – someone's calling in, that's a pretty good buying signal that they're interested, you know, so it's a, a little less hunting uh, that they have to do. So I think it's more enjoyable job and it is going to be more expensive though, you know, to generate your own leads, but I think the closing ratio and things like that. So even though maybe the cost per lead is more, but the cost per acquisitions maybe could be better. Yes, I definitely agree with you on that 100%, Dan. And I want to say the key thing you just said there uh, that I don't, I don't know if a lot of us agents really realize is if you can make your job, and this is, you kind of hinted at it, if you can make your sales producer's job easier, they're more likely to stay with you longer and they're more likely to love their job and have less issues, less drama, less problems, and they're easier to, to work with essentially and easier to grow with the team. Um, and, uh, that's one thing we try to focus One we don't, we, we don't like micromanaging because it takes too much time and energy to micromanage in our agency. It takes way too much time and energy to micromanage. We'll be there to help them and support them. That's our job as leaders to support them and grow and reach what they want to do. Um, but we want to make sure we're bringing leads in. When I started, I got three leads a day. This is common for an agency, right? Get one, three, five leads a day to work. When I started my cousin's agency, I was getting three leads a day. I had to work those leads to the bone, whether it was a $50 a month auto policy or a $5,000 home policy. I had to work that to the bone, right? And try to cross sell and do all these things. And I was working so hard. And what we learned is, man, if we just spend a lot of money on marketing, we don't have to worry about those small $10, 20, 30, 40, $50 a month auto policies. We can say, we can we can make the customer work on our time. And that's one thing that's really strong in our sales process. I always tell my new people, because a lot of people come from the service world, this, this um, the retail world or something, right? Uh, love, uh, love hiring bartenders, waitresses, waiters. 
Um, and what they come from is the customer is always right. No, not in this industry. The customer is not always right. I tell them the customer is not always right. One, because I don't want them to get the wrong coverage. I don't want them to misunderstand what a coverage is. And the cover and the work, the customer will work on my time. Meaning if a customer says, call me at 8 p.m., Brett, I tell them, hey, uh, that's great. Um, I'll, I'll say something along the lines of, hey, okay, that's awesome, 8 p.m. I'm actually going to be at home with my uh, brother right now. We have dinner tonight. Uh, so I'm going to be with home. I know my niece is going to be over as well. So I'm not going to be available then. I get off at 5 or 6 p.m. probably today. Um, how about I give you a call around lunch tomorrow? When's your lunch time? And I end with a question. I overcome the rejection. I show them I'm human. And I show them that they have to work on my time, right? Or our time. I'm showing you that my time is valuable, same as theirs. I, I even throw little hints in there. Hey, I don't want to waste your time or my time. So let's do, 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 do. Like, let's do this. Um, so I show them how that how I'm valued. And I'm no longer a telemarketer on the phone. I'm now a person on the phone. A trust, and, and, and lead, and they'll lead into a trusted advisor and building that rapport and having deeper conversations, deeper meaning with that client. That's kind of like the first start of that. Um, and so I tell them and, they, and they'll respond like, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Have fun with your brother. Right. When they're talking about trying to meet up 8, 8, 8, 8 PM, 8 PM or whatever their crazy time is. Um, then, then they'll be like, yeah, well, um, I have a one hour lunch tomorrow, maybe 12, 12. I mean, how long is it going to take? Ah, probably about 15 minutes. I just need to go over quick things with you. Um, uh, but I'll, I'll let you go, but I want to ask you real quick before I let you go. And I'm going into another question. I love the words real quick. I want to ask you real quick before I let you go, where, what, what, where were they charging you? How much was Allstate charging? Because I know they just had a rate increase, right? I always say something like that. Insurance companies are having rate increases, right? How much are they charging <laughs> you? Keyword charging, not paying. Charging is a bad connotation compared to a uh, good connotation, right? It's got a negative connotation. How much are they charging you each month? How much are they charging you a year? Um, and I know they had a rate increase. It makes them think about it a little bit. Um, and they tell me, they tell me, so, okay, I'll let you go. I'll get that taken care of. And actually, uh, real quick before I let you go, we'll, we'll talk tomorrow. Um, I'll send the, I'll send the quote over after we go over it tomorrow, but I want to let, uh, wanted to ask, is it just you and so-and-so on the policy or whatever it is? I'll just get another piece of information and I'll keep getting information, keep getting information. And finally, at the end, I'm not always acting like I'm about to get off the phone. Finally, at the end, I've gathered all the information I need to get the quote done and then I'll finish it on and maybe I'll, and I'll give them a call, you know, around noon tomorrow, or maybe sometimes I get bold. And if it's a great deal, great price, because I know what they're paying, I'm no one beating him. I'll call him back this same day and say, hey, I know you said you want to talk to noon tomorrow. I'm sorry. This rate just has me way too excited. I had to talk to you about this. This is what I'm getting right now and kind of jump into it. I'll even do that at times. Um, but uh, yeah, going on my little rant here. I get a little passionate yeah, no. about my sales. <laughs> good stuff. Good stuff. I could tell you're a sales trainer, but you know, <laughs> what I really like there is that when you have, when your producers have enough leads, then you, you, the, the last thing we want is a producer to be desperate. Hundred percent. You know, so when you're only getting three leads and you, you just have to be a slave to the you know consumer, they're gonna feel that. So I love it that you know you we keep our producers busy enough so we do have a schedule. We do get busy. Hey, like I I could fit you in. What's your schedule and my schedule look like? So it's not like we're just you know order takers and we'll do whatever we want 100%. for them uh, need for them. So and then it also gives them the perspective of oh, this person is a successful insurance agent. It's not like any des like desperate kid that just wants to uh, get a sell for me that yeah. never sells and only sells like one policy a month. No, this guy is busy. He's always um, he's professional, and uh, I think that's a great way to set the conversation up. So, yeah, what's your sales team look like? Is it um, any like characteristic or how big is it and like how busy yeah. do they get? Yes. Can I go back to the last question? I'm sorry. I'll, I'll definitely jump into that. My ADHD tells me I have to have to talk what we're talking about. Um, to read quick on this, and that's why I love live transfers and call-ins and leads that are easy to work because we, what we were just talking about there, it, it makes them want to stay longer. It makes their job easier. I've been in the trenches, right? I've done that and I'll still sell with them every once in a while. It's very, very rare. I pretty much don't sell anymore, but I want to make their job as easy and loving as possible because they want to stay. That's why our retention with our sales team is astronomically amazing. Uh, we've lost person to moving. We've lost a couple other people, uh, but we've only had, uh, two people i think not work out on the sales time i think since may and we've gone through have like over 25 people in the office right now 
Um, and I think we've had maybe a total of 29, 30 that have come through the doors. Uh, so, and, and a few of those people may have gone to different positions. When someone doesn't work out on our sales team, we move into a different position they may be good at. We use ideal traits to help identify that before bringing them onto us. But if they, for some reason, don't work out for the sales side, then we'll try to bring them to other portions because we've already spent money on trading them, right? Let's be a little cost effective here. We spent already money on training them. They already kind of know the, the industry a little bit. So let's maybe move into a new role, like an agent support role, a service role, a quota role, maybe a life specialist role because they came from the life industry, but now they're trying the PNC, but it didn't really work out for them. So maybe they'll do the life, all the life inside our agency, or maybe all the financial services, right? Try to move into a place they're good. Um, I always try to want to try to move someone to a different spot before uh, telling them, hey, this isn't working out. I, I want you to go find another position. This is obviously, you're not making enough money here because this is sales. You get paid commission. You're not making enough money here. Uh, let's get you to another spot. Um, but uh, as far as our team size is we're sitting at about uh, 12 or 13 salespeople. I got right one. Uh, I think I think it's about 13 salespeople right now. Um, we're bringing in a couple more in this next month. We try to bring in about two a month. That's our goal is our new goal now is to bring about two to three a month. Uh, now, by May of this year, 2024, I want to be at 21 salespeople around 21. And I would like to cap off around 24 because that's how much space we have in the office. Um, so 24 salespeople, I don't want them too, too tight to each other, but, uh, but I think we have enough space for about 24 salespeople and that's what I would kind of do. Um, we will hire service people as needed, but once again, because of how big this team is, and I love the way this, uh, kind of grows and makes my mathematical side of my brain happy. When we grow and someone doesn't work on sales, I can just move them to service so they're better fitted for service. Instead of hiring a new service person that I don't know for sure is going to work out, I have to train them the systems. I can just take the sales producer that's not really working out and say, hey, um, this isn't really working out. Do you want to try out service? Let's look at what that could mean for you and then go over that. Yeah, and wow. Especially. Good thing you have the crisp AI with all that people there. <laughs> yes. Now, once you get to 24 staff members, what are you projecting your monthly premium goals to be? Dan, you're my inspiration for this. I got to I got to admit it's actually very true. Um you and John, uh John Cicerelli, I think that's how you pronounce his name. I've never met him. Um but I know he's number 1 on the leaderboards there uh that everyone kind of can kind of pull up and see. Um, I want to do a million a month. I want to, we want, we want to do a million a month. Our, our agency, our team, our sales team, they always talk about, let's do a million, let's do a million. Um, and the reason is that too, by the way, we do something, uh, I've never told anyone this is I love this. This is actually huge for our sales team. They love this. They talk about it every month. They talk about it to their friends. We do something for our sales team every month. They hit their goals. And I love how you do trophies every, every month to recognize what people have done. I love it. It's brilliant. Um, what we do is we do, we don't do a reward ceremony. We'll do that once a year. Um, but, uh, maybe we'll start doing once a quarter, once a month. I, we, I know my sister used to do it in her agency and it worked well. Um, I just, I don't, Personally, we don't have enough time right now. So when we get to that point where people are trained up, maybe that's something we'll look into. But what we do is a big event. We let them choose. Hey, what do y'all want to do if we hit 560000 in premium this month? You know, last month our goal was 540 and they only did 520. We are they were so close. They were 20000 off. Um, and so I kind of did something small for them, but we didn't we didn't hold to the actual goal. Uh, but they'll say, you know, may, uh, let's go goal card. Let's take a vote. Is everyone, you know, they all kind of get together. They work together as a team. I, I don't like to be a part of it. I want them to figure it out. I just kind of say, you know, I, I trust them to know that the, there is a budget on that. Um, and then go, you know, based on other things we've said, like hibachi grills, you know, uh, Fogo de Chao Brazilian steakhouse, we brought them to bowling with, with buffet, um, and other things that I can't remember right now that we've done. Uh, but we'll let them go. They're like, oh, maybe let's do golf carts next time. Like, no, I love bowling. Can we do bowling again? They'll kind of figure it out, you know, during a sales meeting or something for a little bit. Um, and let them kind of come together as a family, as a team. And they're like, okay, well, we have to fight 540, right? And then when we have agency Zoom, so when someone sells something, it pops up and says, hey, this person has sold this. Uh, and it emails it to the team. You know what they'll do? They'll turn up like, oh, awesome. You know, you'll hear it in an office 20 times a day when there's a sale, right? Oh, yeah, everyone's clapping, cheering. Yeah, let's go. You know, but they're all they're mm -hmm. all getting hyped up. Um, and they're like, okay, we only need 20 more thousand in our daily goal where we only need a hundred thousand in our monthly goal. Who's got a big deal that we can close? You know, they're all trying to motivate each other and hyping in and that all funnels in 
with our big key secret ingredient, which is one big bullpen. We don't have individual offices. One big bullpen allows that communication to come up together. If you're in different offices, it's it's easy to have uh, to have malice towards a coworker because you don't see them every day. You don't interact with them every day. You don't see what they struggle through every day. But when you kind of work together as one big bullpen, it allows that struggles and stuff to interact together. They get a vent to each other when they had a tough customer to deal with, right? Um, and I'm totally fine with that. I want them to be able to talk a little bit. They turn around in their chairs all the time. We'll talk to each other. But I know what they, I know, I trust them. And we, and we, we talk about it a lot. And we, we go over it a lot is they know they have to hit their sales goal. They have an income they have to make. They have families to feed, right? Um, we have a lot of single mothers and they're killing it. <laughs> right now, I'm looking at our mm -hmm. other board. There's a few of them on our top sales producer spots. Um, and um, and they love talking about their kids. They love talking about things. And that's good. Um, yeah, I, I know, you know, sometimes you can kind of walk in and say, hey, what you got working on? Instead of micromanaging and say, hey, get back to work. We kind of like, we'll kind of walk in there and, and see like, hey, what you working on? What can I help you with? You know, I want to help them reach their goal. It's not me trying to even keep them on track. It's that I know they told me and our one-on-ones, right? They, they have one-on-ones with their sales leaders. I do have sales leaders in the office, sales managers, if you want to call them that. I like I like leaders because managers, uh, in my personal opinion and from experience, usually like to micromanage, has a bad connotation. So sales leaders in an office, they do the one-on-ones and they tell them, this is my goal. This is how much I want to make each month. Okay, well, let's kill it, man. Let's find a way for you to do it. Let's let's do this. Um, so I'll come up to them and say, hey, what you working on? What can I help you do to get there? Do you need more leads? What is there, is there something I can look over? Is there quote that's stumping you what can i do for you if you so i always recommend to agents if your team is having trouble trouble staying on task go up to them and ask them what can you do for them not what they can do for you uh wasn't the president said something along that, those lines <laughs> not ask okay. what uh what, what you can do uh what america do for you but what you can do for america um but uh yeah, that's kind of what I like, we like to do in our office. Our, our sales leaders are meant to support the sales team. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like a lot of uh, fun culture too. We're doing something like that ourselves with the life team or or life contest as a team. Awesome. Um, but teams and goals and celebration, those are awesome too. But uh, talk to us a little bit with that much staff members, you know, in sales training, I could tell is your passion. With that big of a team, how do you guys do the sales training? Like, is it Question. through Zoom where you get people in conference rooms or, I mean, it's pretty hard to do in one-on-one. -on -one. Like, how do you train yeah. your, these, you know, things that we just talked about, some of these, you know, objections handling, things like that? Yeah, if I can be completely honest, my team members probably would never say this, but um, AZ Saul is in back of my head. I have done uh, not my due diligence to help properly train them as a sales uh, sales leader. Um, and because I keep getting swamped up with agency owner stuff, 100 to 200 emails a day and all the, the all the unfun stuff that we do every day. Um, and, uh, and so I definitely have not hit my mark on properly training them, but I do love working with them. And I wish that's what I could do most of my day is just help them reach their goals and help them train them. Um, but what we do do is we're trying to get on one-on-ones and Vlad, I think even does this. And it's a thing I, I love learning from other agents. Um, that's, I think that's actually one of our, one of our families, cause all of us in our family are this way. One of our key, um, ingredients to our genetics or something is we're not, we don't have enough pride to just say our way is the best way. I'm always willing to learn and we're always willing to learn from someone else that's doing something better. Um, and, um, and how we always get told role-playing and one-on-ones are great. Well, Vlad keeps harping on it. Right. And I was like, man, I guess he's right. Cause I don't have enough time to work with my dang team and I want to work with them. We need to role play better. We have two sales meetings though, to answer your question, Dan, we have a sales meeting in the morning on uh, Friday at 9 AM. And we have i uh, I'm sorry, we have a sales meeting on Friday and Monday at 9 AM. So Monday and Friday, I just got back from one. Today is Friday. I came all the way home to get a, get my studio mic uh, to on here. And I, I said, I talked to the team. I was like, Hey, I'm going to have, I have to, I have to do y'all dirty here. I'm leaving. I'm not going to be here the rest of the day. I'm going to be at home talking to a huge role model of mine. Uh, and this is a really big, uh, thing for me. I want to be able to, 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 to spend time with him and get some other stuff done that I need to get done today. Um, and so, uh, they said, cool, we'll, uh, we'll handle the fort. We'll give you a ring or a text if we need something. Um, and, uh, so, 
nonetheless, uh, we have the, the meetings. Uh, we kind of go over things like, hey, um, hey, so and so, uh, what did you find out? Didn't weren't you talking about that one uh, underwriter from so and so company from Sagesure or from Wellington, and they told you this, but that's not the thing we've heard from other companies. But it worked out. How did that go? You know, like I get them to kind of chime in and get them to chime in a little bit, and then we kind of learn from each other because I'm not, I don't know those things, Dan. I'm not the guy that's quoting anymore. They are. They're the smart people, not me. <laughs> I'm just some guy that sits behind a desk and tries to do my best for them. Um, so I like to learn from them. They like to learn from each other and then we'll kind of figure things out. It's like, hey, okay, now I've never taught you about flood and none of y'all quote flood. That's a big issue. We're going to find a way to fix that. This is what we're going to do. And then we'll kind of do a flood training or something like we we're supposed to do today, but we didn't get to it and that's fine. We'll get to it next week. Um, and we'll kind of do some training on maybe a proper way to quote a policy because I notice a lot of agents don't like to quote certain things they don't like to quote if it's too time consuming, so they just won't do it. For Texas, it's flood insurance. Agents are just not asking for flood insurance, which is a massive thing in Texas. Hurricane Harvey, for any of my Texas agents out there, you know how that was. If you're if you're an agent, you were farmers or whatever, 2017 was horrible. Answering those calls from customers saying, hey, I don't have flood insurance. My home flooded. It was horrible phone calls. Um, and uh, so we're needing to try to get into the lean into the flood insurance. So I built in a quoter, a specialist that will do their flood quotes for them or all their quotes they don't want to do. That's the point of my quota right now hmm. is that I noticed I, I don't try to fit a, what is it, a round or a square peg in a round hole. I find out what is going to work with them. Um, I've tried over eight years trying to force people to, to agree to one thing, do it this way, do it this way. And they always give pushback. And it's like, why do y'all give me pushback? I know I'm right, right? That's what we think. And it's like, okay. I don't, I don't want to have the mental stress on, let's just find a way to adapt this to how they want to do it, but also get the same results that we need. So I bring in a quoter. Um, the quoter didn't work out at first because he's doing all the quotes that they want to do. And what I learned from that is that I need to now have a quote. I was wrong about how I presented that, that model to them. And I was warned by another agent as well that my, that I was going to fail in that regard. And I did. Um, and so what I learned was the quoter can do the quotes that they don't want to do. Flood quotes. My team doesn't like to do craft lake. They don't like to sell craft lake because they don't get paid as much as craft lake. Rightfully so, we get paid a lot more on farmers. We love selling farmers. So they don't like doing craft lake quotes. So then he'll come in and do some craft lake quotes for them when they have a customer that got rejected from farmers. And instead of just moving on to the next customer because it's good premium, you know, he can do the craft lake quote for them, give them to the sales agent, and then they can present it and sell the policy. So he's, his job is to save them time where they don't want to spend time. Um, and that's where I've been able to, to integrate that because I know a lot of people have quotas and it was a battle to figure out how to make that effective because I know you can think about it logically. If you're, the quarter's paying being paid less than the sales producer and they can do the same task as the sales producer, the miscellaneous tasks, well then let's find a way to make that work. Um, and uh, that's kind of what we're on the journey of right now. We have other roles and stuff that kind of help the sales team fuel up and hit their 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100,000 premiums. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, we're, we're kind of looking at those things this year. <laughs> that's awesome, man. It's amazing how at your age, you have such a good understanding of the business, you know, and I think at that age also, what stands out to me is that, you know, if you got get off to a hot start, you know, you're going to be very um, confident, right, rightfully so, but you just have the right attitude when it comes to managing your team already which I wish I had at your age, you know, Appreciate like that. you're, you're, you're here to help them out. And these things that you're thinking of, of how this, of these small improvements you're making for your agency is all because your intent is to help them out. And I think it all starts from there. So the humility you have with the success you have at this age is something that shows that, man, you're going to be one bright star you know, moving on forward. That's awesome, dude. Oh man. I, I appreciate that, Dan. And I, uh, this is so cliche to say this. It's, it's not really not me. It's my team and it's my family. Uh, that we really just come together. We work together really well. Um, if I'm, if I'm going to say anything about it, about me on that, it's, I'm good at finding, uh, finding a way to work with people. Um, and, uh, and so, that allows me to kind of find and, and work together with people. But uh, man, I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm blessed. I'm blessed to have an amazing family and amazing team. Um, and uh, we keep trying hard. Uh, I'm, I am a single guy. So one advantage I have that I know not all agents will have is I can work the weekends. Um, I'm, I, uh, when we first did this first three months, I was working seven days a week on this. Um, now I'm only really working five days a week. I maybe work every other Saturday and do some numbers or calculations. I'm a huge math nerd. I love figuring out our expenses, our caught, you know, our ROIs, our, you know, our percentage of close ratios here, this, all that fun stuff. I like figuring all that out. I'll do that out like on a Saturday. 
Saturday. And I recommend to anyone, if you can find two to three to four hours on a Saturday or Sunday and just find out what your ROI is for the lead sources, to find out what your close ratio on those lead sources are, that actually starts massively uh, over time, not immediately, over time, gives you a huge increase and in boosting towards your sales. Um, and uh, I also love reading contracts. So I find bonuses and stuff that uh, you never hear about all the time within our contracts. Um, and uh, I love doing that at Allstate as well. So I, I do love reading through those contracts and looking at every bonus that Pharma throws out. I'm on it. I mean, my, I missed my DM. I want it. How do I get this bonus? Let's figure this out. I want this bonus. I want money. I want money. It's free money on the table. I want it. I'm going to grab it. I'm going to reel it in. So I want to find a way to, to do that and find a way to motivate my team to push that as well. Yeah. <laughs> definitely, definitely. I can feel the energy, man. <laughs> definitely, you, you, you definitely have, have that. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I think everyone says that I might be a little too, uh, too energetic. Um, but, uh, I do know one thing I like, uh, Dan, it's talking. I do like to talk people's ear off. So, <laughs> well, well, talking is important too, but also looking at data and reading contracts and stuff like that. That's the technical part of it. You know, sometimes yeah. people have like the real, like social part, great at talking to people, but the technical part, you know, sometimes people like looking at data, but don't really like yeah. talking to people. So you have yeah. a good combination there. What what type of um, data, if you don't mind getting into that part a little bit deeper, yeah, has has been a game changer. Has been a game changer for you. Like that you figured yeah. this out, and this was something that you know, or anything. You know, at this point, I'm just like, what, what is there something you feel like okay would help me out? Yes. Um, now, gosh, oh man, that's a, that's a tough question, Dan, when you're years, <laughs> light years ahead of me. Um, but, uh, right on the spot, I will tell you what has helped uh, me out. And I hope this matters. Um, and I don't think, and I think people are like, yeah, that's kind of important. I actually track all of our expenses. Um, now it doesn't mean I'm tracking all of it. I just have when someone uh, takes an expense or something, I make sure to write down, I have a little ongoing little notepad here. I have a lot of data here that tells us close ratios. Look how far this is going. Close ratios, our expenses, all that fun stuff. Um, and I kind of keep track of that on my phone and the computer. Um, I love tracking our close ratios. So mm -hmm. as you know, Craftlink pays less than farmers, right? So logically you would want to sell more farmers premium. Um, I figure out the ratio of what we're selling in Craftlink and Farmers, and then what agents are selling more Craftlink than Farmers than the average. So the average in the state is about 68%. Uh, for, I'm sorry, Farmers is about 65 to 68% in the state of Texas. The last time I checked, I could be wrong for data people out there. I could be wrong now. Um, we're, we're at 68% Farmers, and I would love to get that number higher. So I have agents that average about 75 to 90% farmers. And then I have agents that average only 60% farmers. So why is it that agents selling about the same premium, 50, 50,000, 40,000, 60,000 premium together? Um, why is it that these have more farmers than these people? So let's, let's actually dig into the small details and things. The thing I am, I will say that I'm not good at a lot of things, Dan. One thing I think I am good at is finding small details that add up on top of each other to create the bigger details, um, the bigger picture. And so I like to dig in and figure out, work with my sales producers, tell my lease teamers, say, hey, uh, this we have this person right here at 60% farmers. They can make more money if they start selling more farmers. We need to find a way to help them do that. Um, we need to stop selling Craftlink as much as we can. You know, So like, wh why are they not trying to find a way uh, to get the uh, home approved because they got rejected over something really dumb? Maybe we can just call underwriting and work with underwriting, see if we can get that approved. So there's there's sometimes little hiccups right there. People are giving up kind of too easy maybe sometimes. Uh, not to say they're not trying, but maybe they don't even know the uh, way to overcome some of those obstacles. So then we'll, we'll kind of dig into that. But numbers can kind of help tell you and show you that there's a problem somewhere. If these people are doing this, but these these people are not well it's a consistent measure so let, let's let's find a way to to get them back up to this part with these other people so we want to sell more farmers because that brings them more money to the agency which means the team will make more money because that's how we operate as, as all agencies um now i like to keep track of those expenses this helps me track of um how to pay compensation so i we change our compensation plan every year and the way to do that is you want to take first, you want to listen to your team throughout the year and say, hey, you know, what are you trying to do? Well, I have five team members tell me I want to start selling 100,000 in premium on average every month or at least every other month. And I'm like, that is an insane goal. 
eight years ago when I was an agent selling 18,000 in premium, I thought that would be baloney. I would never think that's possible, but rates are going up now. So let's do it. Let's get our, 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 uh, our pay raises because any rate increases keep going up. Right. Um, so I look at expenses and I, I compile it all together. I take our average sales producer, I divide it by that number, and that tells you how much the average sales producers cost. For right now, for ours, it's about $7,600. So if I know my average producer that I bring in is going to cost me $7,600, which is on the high end, most agencies are going to be a lot lower than that. They're going to be closer to about $4,200, I think, uh, to about $5,000 something. Um, for average cost per producer. Um, there's a That's lot of expenses. Including like leads and... Right. Yes, everything. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm like, I'll, I'll lead you off some right now. I have 40 something, 50 something expenses on here. Um, retention cards that go out to customers for retention, like birthday cards, travel expenses. If we have to do travel expenses as, a, as an agency, um, automation we have to pay for, um, snacks that we have in the office, appointments, um, uh, setting up appointments. When you when you get someone into your system, you have to pay $10 per appointment, right? You got to pay $50 for the background check. You got staff licensings that we reimburse, AC maintenance, because you got to maintenance the AC in our rental building, uh, bank fees that we have to pay for, ad comp that farmers charges, the 135 they were charging business cards for my sales producers, birthday food, drinking water, office materials, systems that were used, DCS, agency Zoom, DYL, referrals, leads, MVR reports, $110 per person on average, by the way. If someone's out of that, that category, then I know something's going wrong. We can retrain someone that had $800 a month on average in VR pools. They're probably pulling in VR every single time, which isn't needed all the time if you do proper training on that. So let's see what's going on there. Let's get you down to the average of 110. And then that way allows us to do something more for the agency. Now, I don't. Um, the way I operate is if we save money, I want to find a way to give it back to the team. I, I don't need them. I'm a minimalist. I don't really care about objects. Um, I I live off three thousand to two thousand dollars a month, um, so I, I know I'm single. I know I'm young, so I, I am in Melissa, and I, I don't I don't care for things. So I'm going to try to find a way to pump it back into my uh, team if I can. Um, uh, hiring costs, all these things. I mean, those are just what twenty of my. I think there's actually sixty or seventy uh, expenses on. It's a lot. Um, but there's expenses that I promise you this to everyone. There's expenses that you don't realize or you think are minute or small that you don't care about. Those start adding up. Those really start adding up payroll fees per person. The payroll program, there's a flat fee for the payroll program. And then there's a fee for every person I bring on to the payroll program, right? Then you have these uh, taxes you have to pay for salary, taxes you pay for commissions. When you calculate all these things and find out what that average is, and I love doing this, right? I'm kind of, you can tell as I'm passionate and talking away and stumbling on my words. Um, I uh, love figuring this out. And I take that average of 7,600 a producer, right? Um, so 7,600, if you have 10 producers, that's $76,000, not including commissions. One thing you've learned, if you're an agency that uh, pays commissions, you cannot include commissions to your average cost per producer. You have to deduct it from what your uh, total commissions paid out. For example, if your commissions are 20%, and your average commission you pay across your team, you can look across your sales board. What's the average you usually pay? If your average you usually pay is 9%, well, then you want to take away and say, I don't get 20% commission on a policy sell. I get 11% on every policy I sell. Set, sell. Uh, so you take their average commission and deduct it from your average commission per policy sold. And that allows you to tell what your actual commission you're getting is to pay for those expenses. So now I have 11% commission to pay for all those expenses. So then now that tells me, what do I have for room for to make my compensation plan, right? So this is a whole thing going back to what I was talking to. It seems like an hour ago with my rambling. What do, what do I pay? How do I find a way to pay for that compensation plan? How do I adjust that properly for my team? Now that I know my expenses, uh, now I can help figure out what the average of what they're paying. It allows me to, to find out how much I need to make for my own living wage. And then that allows me to bake in how do I pay my team? Um, so now I'm not going into much of the detail. Maybe another day we can because it is a long thing. It's not something that I did in 10 minutes or an hour. Um, but uh, maybe one day we can dive into that. Yeah, well, that, we definitely got into a lot of data there. A lot of information, a lot of good stuff. Um, <laughs> but I think sometimes you're right. You know, I was... I would say I'm, I fall into the category of just looking at to sell, sell, sells and getting that sales number up. And right. but we got to look at our expenses a little bit more carefully, you know, and one of the good things about looking at data I found is that when you look at the data, not, and I don't look at it as closely as you do, but you could find areas where you could help them with training. 
you know, yeah. so you don't have to micromanage them. You can look at the data and be like, oh, okay, now let's talk about this because we see something not, not you know, uh, abnormal here. And I think that's a great way for training purposes to, to look at data rather than just going off field. Um, and then, yeah, I think also something you touched on, which is uh, almost entertaining for me to hear is that how low your keeper expenses compared to how much, <laughs> you know, money you spend on your uh, business. That yeah. ratio there, I think it's a great indicator of someone, well, not only uh, how, how committed you are, but how successful you'll be is uh, how low you could keep your personal expenses compared to how much you're willing to invest in the business. Right. And um, one thing is not everyone's a math person, and I understand that, but I do do recommend to all agents is uh, don't do data. One thing I learned is I was doing data during work hours, uh, and I was like, oh, wow, that, this is horrible time for my management. This, this is me personally. Uh, so what I did is that's why I've now found time on the weekends or after hours. I work till 8 or 9 p.m. or 7 p.m. every day, and I get it at 9 a.m. Uh, I have a lot of team that get in at like 8.30. I'm like, I will never be here at 8.30. Someone else can be here at 8.30, open the office. I'll be here at 9. Uh, so I'll be here at 9, p 9 a.m. for y'all, uh, and I'll leave at 7, 8, or 9 p.m. once again because I don't have those responsibilities after work um, or all the time. So but I, I say is try to find some downtime to at least calculate that once a month, once a quarter. Try to find some downtime, just not during work hours, unless you have literally nothing to do uh, in your office at that time. Uh, but you can always try to find the leads to call or follow up on. Um, but uh, try to calculate that. Calculate a little bit, at least. At least so you have a general idea. Um, you don't have to be as detailed or intricate as I get down or, or granular. I get down into the actual um, numbers, the drill down. Um, but I think figuring that out and kind of figure out a little bit close to what your ROIs, your close rates are good. I mean, we buy live transfers. If people want to know our close ratio on the worst end is about 27, 28%. The high end is 40%, but the average actual average is closer to about 33%, which is the same as most agencies. Uh, it's the same for a lot of agencies, I believe at least, um, about 33%, any, any top sales agency, about 33%. So if you buy three live transfers, that means you close one out of three. If your close ratio is 33%, that ROI typically, depending on what your live transfer is, may be about 90 to $105 uh, per acquisition, you know, is what you're spending. Um, but there is more than just numbers. And that's one thing I'm I'm glad I, I, I do understand because I started in sales. It doesn't necessarily matter that my ROI with this lead is better than this lead because you have to think in a factors of how easy and how fast is it to close this lead compared to this lead. Even if this lead is more or less expensive, Let's actually look, does this make my the job easier for my sales staff to where they can work on two of these leads compared to one of these leads? Okay, so if it's a little bit more expensive, but they're double more efficient, well, this is actually technically a hidden ROI, a higher hidden ROI. It also makes them happier to work this live transfer because the customer wants to talk to them. Well, now that sales producer is going to want to stay with me longer, meaning I don't have to pay money. to. I, I like You got to think about this thing. If you hire someone, right? Brand new off the streets. You have to teach them your ways. You got to teach them the training. That's cost that you're putting into that. I don't want to have to go through that if I can just keep a sales producer for longer and, and keep them and keep them happy and working. So I want to work with them and find ways to keep them happy. And I know a lot of agents say, I try that. I do that. I know that's awesome. And there's and the, as long as you keep um, learning how to do that and learn from other agents on how they do it, try to incorporate. The things we do with our agency doesn't mean you you will or can do those with, the, with, with, with yours. If you have a two-person team, find those little things. You, the two-person team is enough time for you to actually work on one-on-ones with them and find out what motivates them. Find ways you can put things in front of them to give them goals, to stretch for things. Um, but uh, one thing is I, uh, I definitely do is I offer time off on off time, downtime. I try to uh, calculate those those things or look at those data and stuff like that. Yeah, good stuff, Brett. I think those are two uh, main takeaways from our conversation here. You know, one is, you know, look out for your team, always try your best to help them out, right? But two, I think, is to take the time to look at the data. And I totally agree with you. I do that, you know, when there's no one here at the office or at my home, because it's just, you can't do it when you have emails coming in or you have, you know, uh, employees talking to you about some issue they had or just, just or clients trying to reach you, you know, so get into a place where it's like really quiet preferably dark, you know, either the morning or night. I think, I don't know why that helps, <laughs> um, but really going deep into the data and looking at your profit and loss. That's great. I almost wish I could just do that all day. Sometimes I feel like those are like the most productive days. 
Well, that's good. That's good for you. You have a large team. Um, again, as I don't think a lot of people have his team as big as yours or uh, or ours. Um, so getting into that data stuff doesn't uh, return a cost for time as as valuable as maybe a two, four, six, you know, team. Um, uh, or I should say the other way. But usually, when you have a smaller team, spending time all that time on that can actually be a waste of time. Whereas we have we have a big team like you that can be very beneficial because now that you're you're multiplying that time and effort and energy into those numbers. Um, but uh, one thing I wanted to say, Dan, is. Uh, Oh man, I I totally forgot. You're you're saying something good, but uh um we we do we do uh on our leads, one thing I, I let people know, I'm I'm open about this and we try all different types of leads. Live transfers uh and leads guys you buy, we spend about uh $1,250 currently a month per producer. So $1,250 a month per producer on marketing alone, up to $1,500 a month. on marketing per producer alone. I think we're actually going up to 1500 with how hard this market is instead of pulling back on marketing, that's uh, what every agency is doing. We're ramping up marketing. Um, so every time th things get tough and we live in a, a tough industry, instead of pulling back like every other agency, you're right, you don't want the same results as every other agency. You want the results of the top 1% like Dan's. Then, okay, well, let's push money into marketing. So let's pump money into marketing while everyone's pulling out of marketing. So it gives you better opportunity. One thing I always tell my team, one thing I've learned in life is when, uh, and this is, you know, when, stock market crashes, when the world crashes, you read, if you read a lot of books, listen to a lot of videos, read, look at the past. When no one else sees opportunity, that's when the most opportunity presents itself. Because no longer is anyone ever trying to obtain that opportunity because they do not see an opportunity. They're now, they're now shut in because they see things only bad and negative. So they pull away. Why is that good for the people that keep pushing forward? Well, now any opportunity that those people could have had, it's now more because there's no people obtaining that opportunity. Um, so we try to double down when things are bad. Uh, that's why we're hiring. We're still hiring. We're pushing. We're even pushing hiring for harder than we were before. We're pushing marketing even harder than we were before. Well, everyone is pulling away. Everyone's getting out of the industry right now. I mean, this is not, not, you know, unknown knowledge. People are selling the books left and right. People are getting out of the industry. Um, I think it's a great time to buy books right now. Personally, I'm not saying you should, but I'm just saying I, I would love to buy a book right now if I could. I can't. Still too new. Um, or I'm not willing to to uh, jeopardize my contract on that. Um, so, but uh, yeah, buying books, everyone's getting out. You, you can push more into the marketing. And that's why I need to find out, figure out like you, how to generate our own leads. And uh, I think we're starting to tiptoe into that area to help save on maybe cost a little bit, uh, as well as get the leads that we want for our team. Yeah, no, I'll be happy to geek out with you on that stuff too. <laughs> I love it. It's a lot of uh, data involved there too. But yeah, good stuff. Yeah, I do feel like, you know, when everyone's scared, that's the time to get greedy. And yeah. when everyone else is greedy, that's the time to get scared. So yeah. I agree with you right now. There's a lot of opportunities. Um, what product do you have that high of a closing ratio with? Is it auto or home or? Great question. Um, a closing ratio is different for uh different for a lead. Um, it's about like what, five, 8%, maybe our closure share. Our internet leads, our closure ratio is only 1.5 to 2.5%. So our internet lead closure ratio is 1.5 to 2.5%. Um, and I love that. And I'll actually love internet leads because um, that's funny. My, uh, our lead guy is calling me right now. Um, so um, uh, I love internet leads because uh, you can, you can, um, you can rework them. You can uh, automate things on them. Um, and you can, you can kind of drop them if they're worth waste of time, a live transfer because of how expensive they are. You kind of want to spend more time on them trying to attain them, but on uh, internet lead, if it's just a, not a great lead, I tell my team, don't waste your time on a $50 a month auto. If that person is not going to give you all the information and, and, and then see that you're the one helping them and not the other way around, don't waste time on the person. Just tell them, Hey, uh, you're paying $80 a month. Mine might be $70 a month. Would you want to transfer over? Do you have an auto? Do you have a home policy as well? We can do it. They say, no, okay, you're not worth my time. I'm going to go work on this other lead over here that will. And then boom, you're out, you're out of here. That lead's gone. Um, I tell them to, it's all right. I, I want them to spend time on the leads that actually make them money. Cause that makes me money. It makes us money. Um, so I I'm fine with them getting rid of these not so great leads, these low paying customers, low paying customers always have the most problems, right? What do they say? A, the 80, 20 rule, right? 80% of your problems come from 20% of your customers. 80% <laughs> of your profit comes from 20% of your customers. Um, and, uh, those are always full little statistics and things I like to look into, but, um, 
yeah, just don't don't spend so much time. I think Vlad even preaches it too, and I'm so glad he does because no other agent really preaches this. Don't make your team call a fifty dollar, a hundred dollar a month lead. You know, and I'm sorry, I know. Rates are different in other in uh, different states, but it's doing a factor, you know, all state or that's not all state, Texas, and all auto policies like 250, 300, 400 dollars a month, you know, uh towards the, the middle end there. So $50 a month is nothing. That's not worth our time. Um, for other states, it might be 10, 20, 30 dollars a month auto policies are not worth your time. Um, so just kind of identify that and don't force your team to call those people 10 or 20 times. Let them work it. It doesn't mean the second someone tells them what price they are, they don't they don't just throw it away. They say, OK, now I'm at the point of I'm going to give this customer five or 10 minutes. I now know what they're paying because I'm going to ask that towards the front end. I'm now not, I'm now not going to spend a ton of time on this customer. So if this customer doesn't give me the pay information and go over the coverage really fast, they're not really gonna worth my time. I'm gonna throw it over to them, what I have. If they wanna do something with it, if they wanna chase me for the quote, then good. But I'm going to work on these people now while they can chase me. If they chase me, then I know they're interested and I know they're willing to buy. But if they're just looky loose, right? I think Jordan Belfort says, if they're just looky loose, um, they, I know they're not worth my time. Um, look, right. You got, you got your people that are buyers. I think Jordan Buffett calls them buyers in heat. People that are ready to buy, ready to go. And you have your looky loose people that just kind of want to quote, see what's out there, you know, but they're not fully interested. And you, you want to identify what type of those people are. And that takes time and experience. And you want to get those people out of your pipeline as fast as possible. Maybe follow up with them later. Um, and just kind of shoot it over to them, move on to the people that are your, your people that are, you can potentially sell at that time. Yeah, I think that strategy is really important when it comes to writing the bigger premium, you know, and writing that much premium per month because it's about the same amount of work. It's just... <laughs> It is the same amount of work. Yeah, it's yeah exactly what you said right there. You nailed it. Uh, why would I spend an hour doing a fifty dollar a month auto when I can spend an hour doing a two hundred dollar a month auto, three hundred dollar a month auto, or a five thousand dollar home policy that you sometimes run into? You know, um, so it's definitely time efficiency uh, that's very very big uh, in making your team as as efficient as possible. Because I know we're always trying to make ourselves efficient. I actually try to find ways to make my team efficient because of how big our team is, it's a better return for me. I try to find ways to make their lives efficient more than I try to find a way to make my life efficient. Uh, but I still do. I still find ways to make my life efficient. But most of my thinking is spent on how do I make their life easier and more efficient than mine. Um, and I think that is what helps factor, once again, to our retention of our sales producers. They love sticking around. They love working with us. Um, I'm, I'm to be complete, completely transparent, two of my producers have gotten offers with way higher pay um, that I'm like, I have no idea how that agency's paying it. It's a new agency though. So maybe they're going to have a rude awakening of what they can actually pay to their staff. Um, but uh, they said they denied it. They told me I, I, I denied it. I'm not asking for more money. I just want you to know that's out there. Other people in the agency may get that invite, uh, but we love it here. I've worked at other agencies before and it's like a military compound. I, I, I don't ever want to go back there when I've won three, five leads or even agencies that I've worked at that have infinite leads just like this agency. But the environment is horrible. I just don't want to work there anymore. Um, and so that allows us to, to keep on to people because we really enjoy working with them. Um, we really, really like our team. Uh, and I tell people, if they're not working on sales, I tell them, let's find you a different job somewhere. Like if if you don't want to do insurance at all and don't want to be a part of it, like let's find you, find something else. Like you're not going to offend me. Uh, go go find something. Like I, I don't I don't want you to waste time here. You know, don't waste your professional time here. Yeah, man. Yeah. So you, you got it. I don't want to say all covered, but yeah, you got a lot of the, you know, <laughs> the main stuff down. The management is such a big piece of running an agency, yeah. you know, so just how you look at your people and your attitude towards how to help them. The management piece is right there. Obviously, the sales training and your sales background and then looking at data and systems, too. So those three things are so critical to uh, have, being a successful insurance agency owner. And those are three things that you're strong at. So there's no it's not a surprise to me now why you're getting so much success at uh at with in such a short amount of time so the expense thing thank you for that you know yeah. um, this weekend i'm gonna do that i'm gonna look at every more way more details than i used to i just looked at you know some of the bigger numbers but not really go deeper into and per producer things like that so that was a great thing that you are helping me out with so that was pretty high level there but uh to close this off at the end what about something super basic super simple that would help agents out actually work with your lead providers if you're a lead providing comp agency um 
actually work with your lead providers uh, and, and and try to, and don't just call one lead company, call all of them and work with all of them and see which ones are willing to give you the better deals. Uh, don't go with the company that's going to make you pay $13, $15 per lead. Uh, that That's just outrageous. The more you buy, the more you, the cheaper you can get on a price. Uh, I think that's common knowledge to anyone. Um, so just actually uh, try to work with your lead providers and treat them well. They will sometimes give you rewards, some type of kind of promotion. I've gotten promotional offers because the people, they like working with me. Uh, they'll pilot programs with me because the amount of leads we buy. Um, so I, uh, I do recommend that if you are a lead purchasing agency, um, actually try to work with your lead providers um, and be nice to them. And they, they will return that favor. Uh, but I would, I would say, um, Just try to find a way to simplify everything in your agency the best you can. Yeah. Well, without leads, nothing gets started. So um, Yeah. I love it that you, you talked about that as the most simplest thing that we need to focus on is the leads, how much are they going to be, how are you going to get them, what quality they are. So focusing on that, working with the lead providers as your partner, I think that's great advice because, again, if you don't have a lead, you don't have a conversation, and you don't have sales, and you don't have an agency. So all great stuff, Brett. I mean, uh, we had a fire conversation. You packed so much stuff into this hour. Oh no, <laughs> I didn't It mean was, to talk too much. <laughs> uh, no, no, that's, that's what, you know, these are for, for you to share, you know, what you know, and you did it and it was entertaining at the same time. I'm not sure if you try to do that on purpose, but. <laughs> Oh, no, I hope so. I hope so. I, uh, I think a lot of people don't think I'm entertaining usually. Uh, wow, Dan, it's been a pleasure. I, I can't tell you how much of an honor to be on here. And, and you flatter me, all these compliments. Um, and uh, it's hard not to, to feel good about that. Um, because, man, I, I just once again, I've watched your videos for so long. Uh, and it's like, wow, I, I hope one day I could be up on there and. Here I am. I'm that one day. So uh, this is my what are they called the the five five minutes of fame. Uh, but uh, it's it's a it's been a pleasure learning from you. Uh, talking to you has been huge, and hopefully we can learn more off each other. I hope one day I can have some more to offer you as we grow, because uh, we will never stop growing. I promise you that. I want that number one spot. So uh, well, I'm I'm competitive. <laughs> Yeah, no, same here. I'm always learning and growing. So I learned a lot already today. So I'm looking forward to yeah, keeping in touch with you and helping each other because there's a lot of um, there's a lot of good stuff coming up. And I feel like that the younger generation is going to be a lot sharper than we are. So I want to keep up with you guys. So <laughs> Yes. I'm definitely go going to uh, help where you, with experience if I can with, with you. But um, Yeah. I, I'm pretty sure I'm very sure it's going to be a reciprocal relationship as we help each other. That's Going awesome. forward. I, I, hey, I'm, I'm even growing out. I have a 20 year old in my agency teaching me stuff about technology. I had no idea existed. Uh, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm aging out, so to say, in the tech world. So I'm learning from, for newer and younger people coming in. Um, which is awesome. But hopefully maybe next time we can go over to an even higher level of stuff that we do in our agency. Um, I uh, I didn't know necessarily exactly what we wanted to touch on today. For anyone that knows, we had no idea what we were going to talk about. We said, hey, me and Dan was like, let's let's just talk about things. We've never been on a phone call before together. Let's just figure out some stuff. We just started talking about stuff in this this meeting. So maybe next time we can do a higher level stuff. And I'm, I'm more than welcome to um, more than fine with going over some of our higher level stuff uh, that we do implement or we think about in our agency. Awesome, Brett. No, thank you so much for your willingness to share, man. I think that's great because, you know, um, that's something I believe in. And that's the whole reason I have this, you know, conversation for the agents is so we could learn from each other. So you're so willing to share everything you know, what has helped you. And I think uh, that's going to come back to you. So I know you're just getting started, but man, you got one bright future. I appreciate the man. I hope let's keep going. Let's find it. Let's do a bright future together. Farmers is the best contract is out there on the market right now. I care what anyone says is not the grass is not green on the other side. I've been on the other side. And no, Farmers is currently, as of right now, is still the best place I've seen. Yeah, absolutely agree. Thank you, Brett, for your time. Uh, you definitely have a part two. Let's uh, kind of think about what we're going to talk about. We'll go even deeper in, um, you know, uh, your knowledge. So looking forward to that, Brett, and uh, we'll be in touch, man. Awesome. Sounds good. I feel like I made it past the first interview, right? Now I got to make it to the second interview. Uh, no, you, you definitely